Good afternoon, everyone. Today, the Atom Seminar has the great pleasure to welcome Professor Amir Hajji Akbari. He currently holds the position of Assistant Professor of Chemical and Environmental Engineering at the Yale University, USA. Professor Hajji Akbari is broadly interested in the application of the modern theoretical and computational tools rooted in thermodynamics and statistical mechanics to study the thermodynamics and kinetics of phase transitions in salt matter system. His particular focus is on crystallization and aggregation in colloidal, aqueous, and biological systems. Examples include gas formation in the atmosphere, colloidal self-assembly, and protein folding and aggregation. He is the author of around 30 journal publications that have been cited around uh, 1,200 times, with special high highlight for the 2009 Nature paper, Disorder Quasi-Crystalline and Crystalline Phases of Densely Packed Tetrahedra, with 400 and 13 citations alone. He has received a Young Investigator Award in 2020 from the AITA CONCEP and National Science Foundation's Career Award in 2018. Welcome, Professor Haji Bari. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Please, please feel free to start your presentation. Thanks, Yuri, for the very nice introduction. So let me uh, share my screen. Uh, okay. <clears throat> All right, good day, everybody. Uh, uh, yeah, first, I would like to thank Brad uh, for this invitation and also to commend him uh, and his colleagues for putting together such a wonderful series. Uh, so my name is Amir and my group primarily focuses on using uh, and developing and using advanced sampling techniques to study uh, different types of rare events. And today I'll be talking about some work that we have been doing on ice nucleation for the last couple of years. I don't think I need to provide a detailed uh, uh, explanation of what a rare event is for this audience. So just briefly, if you have a process that you, and you can uh, quantify the progress of that process using a signal or an order parameter, in the case of a rare event, that signal will basically fluctuate around its initial value before quickly jumping to its final value. So whenever you have a separation of time scales between this waiting time and this transition time, you will have a rare event, which is different from a slow event in which the order parameter slowly changes from its initial value to its final value. Now, there are many, many examples of processes that can be rare event in material science and biology. Uh, today, I will be talking about crystallization at length. But another phenomena that we study in my group and I won't be talking about today is the hindered transport of ions and small molecules through nanoporous membranes. Here are some other uh, phenomena that we're marginally interested in, including protein folding, liquid-liquid phase separation. Uh, oh, sorry, this went too fast. DNA hybridization and hydrophobic evaporation. Now, the reason that rare events are rare is because their occurrence requires crossing a free energy barrier. And the system has to find the right fluctuation to go through that barrier and therefore, the larger that barrier is, the longer it will take for the system to try all the fluctuations and find the right one. So for example, if you're thinking about crystal, crystallization, and if you start with a super cold liquid, in order for this liquid to freeze, uh, small uh, po crystalline particles or nuclei have to emerge in the system. Now, these small nuclei are unstable and they melt immediately after they form. And every now and then, one of them becomes uh, sufficiently large to then uh, grow without thermodynamic resistance and take over the rest of the system. And indeed, if you look at the schematic free energy profile of the system as a function of the size of this crystalline nucleus, you see that there is an initial increase in free energy and that's because of uh, the energetic penalty associated with forming a liquid solid interface. That penalty, however, scales with the surface area of these droplets while 
the thermodynamic driving force for crystallization scales with the volume. So eventually the volumetric term uh, wins over and this curve has a maximum. The height of this maximum is typically known as the nucleation barrier. And the process of forming basically a, a nucleus on top of this barrier, which is called a critical nucleus, is called nucleation. And there is a characteristic nucleation time uh, for starting here and getting here, which is generally speaking a stochastic variable that depends on the nucleation barrier. But when you form a critical nucleus, there is no longer uh, any resistance for its further growth. And the growth time scale is uh, dominated or determined by the transport properties of the liquid like viscosity and self-diffusivity. So in my group, we are interested in using molecular simulations to study different aspects of nucleation, including estimating the nucleation time, the nucleation barriers, and the critical nucleus size, and to characterize the mechanism of nucleation. In other words, what's happening at the molecular level when you start here and get here. And for that, we uh, use uh, different types of advanced sampling techniques. One of the techniques that we use a lot is, uh, is a technique called forward flux sampling, which was developed by Dan Frankel in mid 2000s. And the way that, and here is how this technique works. So let's say this is your configuration space uh, and you sort your configurations using an order parameter which in the case of crystal nucleation will be the size of the largest crystalline nucleus in the system. So on the left-hand side, you have the liquid basin, which I denote with A, and on the right-hand side, you have the solid basin B. And the goal is to calculate the average time that it takes for a trajectory that starts in A to reach B. Now in FFS, this is uh, achieved by a, uh, partitioning this intermediate region uh, using level sets of this order parameter and by recursively calculating the flux of trajectories that leave A and reach each of these milestones. So first you start with a representative configuration in A and you feed it into what we call a basin simulator, uh, which basically launches a dynamic trajectory from its not usually a molecular dynamics uh, trajectory. And it monitors for first crossings of lambda zero right after the trajectory has left A. So here you have one such crossing and you save the configuration when you have one. And then you continue the trajectory. Uh, and here you have another one, two more. And the number of crossings per unit time uh, will basically give you an effective flux of leaving A and reaching lambda zero. Now, generally speaking, people normalize this flux with a proper measure of the system size. So for example, in nucleation, depending on whether you have homogeneous or heterogeneous nucleation, you normalize it with the volume of the, of the system or the surface area of the crystal nucleating substrate. Then you get a bunch of configurations uh, uh, at, I think it went back for some reason. Let me see what happened. So, so then you, uh, oh, this is not, I'm, I'm really sorry, this is a Zoom problem. Then you get a bunch of configurations at or close to lambda zero, which then you pass on to an FFS iterator. And the goal of an FFS iterator is to uh, calculate the transition probability of starting a trajectory in lambda zero and reaching lambda one. Uh, and so you launch uh, uh, FFS uh, like uh, MD, uh, I think there is a problem. Okay. So you launch MD uh, trajectories from each of these configurations and you calculate the fraction of those trajectories that are successful and by reaching lambda one before getting back to the basin. And that fraction gives you the transition probability of starting in lambda zero and reaching lambda one. You get a bunch of configurations at or close to lambda one. You pass them on to the next FFS iterator 
and you continue this until you your transition probability approaches unity, which means that you have well past the uh, corresponding free energy barrier. And by putting together these flux and these probabilities, you get an effective flux, or in our case, the nucleation rate. Now, this method has been extensively used since its development to study different types of rare events. And we discussed these applications in this paper with my first graduate student. Uh, and one of the advantage of FFS is that you don't need microscopic reversibility of the underlying dynamics, and you can use it, uh, therefore, to study non-equilibrium processes, uh, uh, which, which has been a main focus of its application in the literature. Despite its usefulness, uh, there is a key assumption in conventional FFS that limits its applicability. Uh, and that assumption is the fact that the utilized order parameter has to be uh, smooth, which means that it doesn't, it doesn't, it's, it shouldn't undergo high amplitude, high frequency fluctuations around along a dynamic trajectory. And the consequence of this smoothness is that when a trajectory crosses a milestone, uh, it lands at a configuration that is at or very close to that milestone. And as a result of that, milestones are crossed sequentially uh, when you are using an, a smooth order parameter. Now, most phenomena, however, uh, can only be described using jumpy order parameters or order parameters that can undergo a large, uh, uh, high amplitude, high frequency fluctuations and when you have jumpiness, several things can happen. First is multi-milestone jumps. So imagine that you have a trajectory and you're monitoring for first crossing of lambda k, but if you have a jumpy OP, then that might land you well beyond the next milestone or lambda k plus one. So you completely skip this intermediate region. And even if that doesn't happen, Crossing lambda k might actually land you fairly far away from that target milestone. So you might basically get here, uh, which is halfway in between lambda k and lambda k plus one. And this is fairly common. So this is, for example, a time series of the size of the largest crystalline nucleus in the Leonard Jones system. And as you can see, it's fairly jumpy. And you can see this probably more vividly by looking at this jump probability distribution along a dynamic trajectory for different dynamic trajectories for different systems. And conventional FFS is basically doesn't have a rigorous method for handling this kind of jumpiness. And we, we therefore developed a new technique known as jumpy uh, FFS that is discussed in this paper uh, to handle these types of uh, fluctuations. And I'm not going to go through the technical details of this method, which you can read about in this paper. I will just describe a simplified variant of JFFS uh, in the context of the algorithm that I just described a few slides ago. So you start with a representative configuration. You set lambda zero, but not any other milestone. You feed that configuration to the basin simulator, and you get a bunch of crossing events. But because your order parameter is jumpy, those crossing events basically uh, will have different uh, order parameter values. You calculate the maximum order parameter visited by these configurations, and you set your next milestone to be beyond that maximum. And if you do so, all these configurations will have what we call identical jump histories. And you can pass all of them to the next iterator without really distinguishing them. Then you look for crossings of lambda one, which you have specified here. You get a bunch of new configurations, which will have different lambda values. You determine the maximum. You set your next milestone to be beyond that maximum. And you pass on all these configurations irrespective of their lambda value to the next iteration. Now, if you don't do that, we show in this paper, and for example, pass on only the configurations at each target milestone 
uh, that are very close to that milestone, then you can underestimate the rate by sometimes several orders of magnitude. So this, this procedure is essential for getting a more accurate estimate of the nucleation rate. So, and the overwhelming majority of the calculations that I will be presenting today have been conducted using John PFFS. So today I'll be talking about two problems. The first problem is regarding how free interfaces impact ice nucleation. But since I'm talking to a, a sim primarily simulations audience, I would like to talk about some ancillary work that we have been doing on quantifying finite size effects in computational studies of nucleation in general, and we use ice nucleation as a special case here. So first, let me talk about free interfaces and ice nucleation. So ice can form on many different, many different environments on Earth, but its form formation is perhaps never as consequential as in troposphere, where you have atmospheric clouds that have water micro droplets, uh, which can then freeze uh, under the right conditions. And the amount of ice that you have in a cloud not only determines its light absorbing properties, but the likelihood of it producing rain and snow, and is therefore a very important input parameter in climate modeling. Yet, it is a quantity that's not easy to predict. And that difficulty arises from the fact that pure water it does not easily nucleate ice homogeneously. And you can easily supercool uh, super water micro droplets for temperatures as low as 235 Kelvin. And if you have really good uh, uh, equipment with high temporal resolution, you can isolate micro droplets, supercooled micro droplets at temperatures as low as 227 Kelvin. As a result, all of our day-to-day -day experience of freezing occurs through heterogeneous nucleation. And the overwhelming uh, uh, majority of atmospheric freezing events do so as well, in which you have an external, generally insoluble surfaces that uh, facilitate freezing by decreasing the nucleation value. Then there are a bunch of different types of materials that can heterogeneously nucleate ice with their ability to do so characterized using what is called the kinetic freezing temperature, which is the smallest temperature, the largest temperature at which you observe instantaneous macroscopic freezing when you immerse these particles within water micro droplets. Now, since we are interested in atmospheric freezing, we are dealing with micro droplets, and these micro droplets have a lot of free interfacial surface area. And the question is, that we are interested in is whether free interfaces impact ice nucleation in any shape or form. And in order to see the importance of that, I would like to walk you through a very simple thought experiment. So let's say you have a water droplet of radius R, and, let, and you can imagine that there will be a region of thickness L sub I at its surface uh, where this region will be strongly impacted by the presence of the free interface. And as a result, one can expect nucleation to occur at different rates within these two regions. And for now, I will focus on homogeneous nucleation, but you can make the same arguments about heterogeneous nucleation as well. So let's say you know the thickness of this region and you know these two respective nucleation rates then you can write the apparent volumetric nucleation rate of the whole droplet as a function, as the sum of this uh, bulk contribution, uh, sorry, this went too quickly again, as a sum of this bulk contribution and surface contribution. Now, if bulk nucleation is faster or as fast as surface nucleation, this apparent volumetric rate will be size independent. And for droplets of all sizes, you will have bulk dominated nucleation. On the flip side, if surface nucleation is orders of magnitude faster than bulk nucleation, then you will have a size dependent rate. And for droplets that are sufficiently small, 
nucleation will be surface dominated. Now, this latter scenario uh, in the case of homogeneous nucleation is referred to as surface freezing. And it is important for us to determine whether uh, water undergoes surface freezing in this sense or not, because atmospheric droplets are polydispersed. And if there is any size dependence for the nucleation rate, you wanna be, you wanna know and be able to predict it as such in order to more accurately predict uh, nucleation events locally, say in atmospheric clouds. Now, the way that you would generally detect surface freezing in experiments is you basically start with droplets of different sizes and you, calculate, you measure the uh, nucleation rate uh, for each family. And when you have these rates, you can either see whether you have this uh, scaling. Uh, sorry, this is stock again. I don't know why. You have these sizes, this scaling of rate with size, but generally speaking, nucleation data are not clean enough. They have a lot of error bars to allow you to do so. So people rather look at the temperature scaling of these apparent rates with droplet size. And based on these latter types of experiments, uh, there seems to be uh, a lot of indication that uh, ice nucleation, basically water undergoes surface freezing. So you have the, this tendency of free interface to facilitate homogeneous nucleation. The evidence, however, is not conclusive because there are a lot of quirks and complications in interpreting these rate calculations when rate measurements, when you have polydispersity. And no matter how good your equipment are, you will always have some polydispersity in the family of droplets that you study experimentally. And therefore, this is still regarded as one of the 10 biggest open questions about ice. Now, on paper, molecular simulations are excellent tools to address this question because you can basically get direct evidence for or against surface freezing. The problem though, is that what you find and what you conclude really depends on the way that you set up your simulations. What force field you use, what system size, and what, you, what geometry you consider. So here I would like to showcase two earlier works that were done before we got interested in this problem. So this is a work from uh, Pavel Jungberg's group who basically simulated freestanding thin films of a six site uh, water model. And they observed that there is a tendency for faster freezing in the subsurface region of these films. These simulations were, however, conducted in very small boxes. And, it, and as far as I know, there is no report of trying to reproduce these findings in larger simulation boxes. So we really don't know whether these are impacted by finite size effects or not. The second work that I would like to highlight was done in Julia Gali's group. And they basically looked at the MW potential. They looked at nano droplets of this coarse grain model. And as you can see here, when the, the droplet the diameter decreases, there is a precipitous decrease in the nucleation rate. However, we know that in nano droplets, we have the strong Laplace pressures and it's not really clear that this decrease is arising due to this Laplace pressure, which we know will make nucleation more difficult in water, or it's basically coming from the suppression of uh, nucleation at the free interface. So when I was still a postdoc in uh, Professor De Benedetti's group at Princeton, we got interested in this question and we tried to address it systematically by calculating bulk nucleation rates for different models, and then calculating rates uh, for uh, freestanding tin films uh, that had roughly the same volume uh, as the bulk simulations. And what we observed was that for them, the, and the, 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 the advantage of simulating uh, freestanding films was that they had flat interfaces. So we didn't have to worry about the effects of curvature, 
and Laplace pressure. And what we observed was that for the MW model, uh, even for with flat interfaces, there is a suppression of nucleation. So film rates are consistently lower than bulk rates under the same conditions. And when you made the films thinner, the rate even went down, uh, became lower further. So the, clearly this model doesn't have a tendency to exhibit surface freezing. But when we looked at the tip 4 p ice model that was developed by uh, Karloff, uh, with, and which is one of the best water models for studying ice and snow, we observed the opposite trend, that there was a tendency for faster freezing in the film geometry. Now, there are a lot of interesting mechanistic tidbits about these works that I'm not gonna go through in the interest of time, but the bottom line is that we can't really address the surface freezing question using these existing water models. But here's the interesting part. Free interfaces can also impact heterogeneous nucleation. And one of the fascinating examples of that is an intriguing phenomenon known as contact freezing, in which a collision between a dry ice nucleating particle and a pristine water micro droplet results in nucleation that's several orders of magnitude faster than immersion nucleation, which is when you have the same particle immersed well in the interior of this droplet. And for a long time, it was, and the, 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 the prevailing narrative was that this enhancement arises due to the transient effects due to the collision or due to the existence of a three-phase contact line that presumably nucleated ice at a faster rate. But there were these very cool sets of experiments by Raymond Shaw's group in 2005 in which they looked at these three scenarios. So you had the immersion scenario, here. Here you have the traditional contact scenario where the ice nucleating particle is approaching the droplet from outside. So you have a contact line. But they also looked at this third scenario in which the particle was inside the droplet, but it's very close to the surface. And what they observed was when they decreased temperature, these two droplets froze at the same kinetic freezing temperature, which was a few Kelvin higher than the kinetic freezing temperature for this immersion scenario. And that made them conclude that maybe what matters here is the proximity of the free interface and the ice nucleating particle and not the contact line or these transient effects due to collision because they repeated these uh, experiments in cycles of heating and cooling. So there wasn't really any transient effect and a collision. And they later published multiple papers in which they showed that contact line doesn't nucleate ice at a faster rate un unless under very specific circumstances. So therefore, this begs the question of whether surface and contact freezing are related in any shape or form, because presumably, if a free interface can enhance homogeneous nucleation, which is, which is supposedly happening in surface freezing, it will likely also be able to enhance heterogeneous nucleation. And molecular simulations are excellent tools for addressing this question because you can concoct force fields that are otherwise similar, but have different uh, surface freezing propensities and see whether they also undergo contact freezing in this proximity sense that I just defined. And in order to do that, we uh, started with the uh, MW potential developed by Valeria Molinero. For those of you who might not know, uh, you represent each water molecule using a single interaction site. And in addition to the two body terms that we have in uh, most potentials, there is a three body term that favors uh, the formation of tetrahedral angles and therefore mimics hydrogen bonding and tetrahedrality. 
And you can tune the relative strength of this three body term using this tetrahedrality parameter lambda, which is by the way, different from the lambda that I used for describing order parameter earlier in my description of FFS. And uh, when I was still in Pablo's group, we uh, conducted a study in which we assessed the sensitivity of different features of these water-like liquids to changing lambda. And we looked at many different properties, but the one that is relevant to this work is the surface freezing propensity. We already knew that MW doesn't undergo surface freezing, but it turns out that when you decrease tetrahedrality, at some point, the surface freezing uh, propensity flips uh, and you have a force field that has faster surface nucleation, which is this empty box, uh, empty symbol versus bulk nucleation. So we decided then to pick MW as a stand-in for a water-like liquid that doesn't undergo surface freezing and this modified force field, which we call SW21, that undergoes surface freezing, put liquid films of both models next to a graphene wall and change the thickness of these films and calculate the nucleation rate. Now, our expectation was that for the non-surface freezing liquid, the rate of these nucleation within these films will either be insensitive to film thickness or will decrease as the films became thinner. For the surface freezing liquid, however, we expected the opposite. And this is precisely what we observed. Here you can see the rate measure calculations for MW. You see that they are uh, uh, virtually insensitive to film thickness. And we repeated these in two temperatures to make sure that uh, basically there is not a change of regime in temperature. Uh, and, uh, but for the SW21 model that undergoes surface freezing, you see that the, nucle the heterogeneous nucleation rate increases by around six orders of magnitude when you go from here to here. So this clearly uh, supports our key hypotheses, uh, but then we were interested in knowing why nucleation is so fast here. And in order to answer that question, we first looked at the geometric spread of the crystalline nuclei that formed during the nucleation process in all these systems. So we created a, Z, the, a histogram of the Z coordinates of those, the molecules that were part of the largest uh, cluster, that of the configurations that had some progeny at the last milestone. In other words, they contributed to the nucleation pathway. And what we observed was that in this ultra thin SW21 film uh, that undergoes super fast nucleation, there were two interfacial peaks uh, next to the graphene and the free interface, and then a weaker peak in the middle. While for the thicker SW21 film that doesn't undergo fast nucleation, the peak intensity decreases as you get farther away from graphene. And when we looked at the shape of the critical nuclei, you see that they are H or hourglass shaped here, uh, where you have two fat regions at each interface, and then there is a thin connector, uh, while in the thicker field, they basically look like a spherical caps that are reminiscent of classical heterogeneous nucleation. And when you looked at the MW model, peak intensities consistently decrease when you get further away from the surface and the nuclei looked like a spherical cap-like uh, and reminiscent of heterogeneous nucleation. And, uh, and, we, and so since the rate is uh, 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 faster here, uh, which means that the nucleation barrier is lower and we calculated the nucleation barriers, and there seems, it seems like that the nucleation barrier is this ultra thin geometry is 12 kT slower, uh, smaller than the nucleation barrier here. And the question that we wanted to address was whether the formation of these hourglass shaped nuclei uh, contributes to this decrease. So we wrote down a model based on classical nucleation theory. So this is the, free energy of formation of a composite nucleus uh, comprised of two spherical caps forming at each interface and potentially a cylindrical connector. 
And all the physical pro uh, properties in this uh, model can be estimated from uh, simulations. In particular, for estimating contact angles, we looked at the critical nucleus size for heterogeneous versus homogeneous nucleation, which is related to this uh, parameter called the potency factor, which is also related to the contact angle. So we estimated these contact angles for the two interfaces. And by plugging them into this model, which we could also only solve numerically, uh, we showed that there will be a decrease in the nucleation barrier by around 6 kT for these ultra thin fields, which clearly shows that the formation of our glass shaped nuclei decreases the nucleation barrier, but it's not quantitatively accurate because the actual decrease is around 12 kT. This could just be because of limitations of CNT and CNT like models, but there could be other explanations as well. And in order to exhaust all possibilities, we uh, inspected the free interfacial regions of supercooled liquid supported films. So we looked at the last density peak and we compared the structural properties of these free interfacial regions with the, those of the freestanding films of the same thickness. And as you can see here, for example, we looked at the radial distribution function and you clearly see that there is a difference here that in the supported film, the RDF has a weaker second peak and a shallower first valley. Now these differences might look small, but they are statistically significant. The error bars in these estimates are uh, thinner than the thickness of these lines. And this difference basically goes away when you go to the thicker field. So clearly the existence of an ice nucleating particle very close to the surface in this ultra thin field modulates it structurally. And in MW system, we don't see any of that as well, and not surprisingly. And these structure modulations go well beyond RDF. Here uh, you can see the, Q, the local Q3 profile, which is different in the ultra thin film, but that difference goes away when you go to thicker films. And it looks like this Q3, the rightward shifting Q3 comes from the change in the number of nearest neighbors, as you can see here which again goes away when you go to thicker films. So therefore we have a nice nucleating surface that modulates the structure of the free interface and makes it different from its equilibrium structure in the absence of the uh, ice nucleating particle. And that change will increase the uh, liquid vapor surface tension and will decrease the contact angle at the free interface. And as you can see here, this is a very crowded figure. I don't wanna go through the details, but the bottom line is that when you decrease the free interfacial contact angle, you increase the amount of uh, uh, enhancement that you get. Uh, in other words, the this delta G dip is the difference between the free energy of classical heterogeneous nucleation and heterogeneous nucleation through the formation of an hour glass shaped nucleus. In order to make sure that our findings are not artifacts of the structure of the wall, we also conducted some calculations using structureless LJ93 walls. And we basically observed the same behavior. If anything, the enhancement in nucleation in ultra thin films was stronger. It was around 16 orders of magnitude for this state point. And we basically observed the same trends to very strong interfacial peaks uh, when we looked at the crystalline nuclei, as you can see here, and a change in RDF, Q3 profiles, and the number of nearest neighbors. So in so we were therefore able to establish a direct relationship between contact and surface freezing, and were able to uh, propose a new mechanism for the fastness of contact freezing, which involved the formation of these hourglass shaped nuclei. And our CNT based theoretical model also did a reasonably good job of explaining the underlying physics of why our glass shape nucleus formation facilitates or can facilitate nucleation. 
So now I'd like to switch gear in the remaining uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, talk about some ancillary work that we did on detecting and quantifying finite size effects in computational studies of heterogeneous ice nucleation. So we did this as an offshoot of the project that I just described because we wanted to make sure that our calculations were not impacted by finite size effects. And I think almost everybody in this uh, uh, audience knows that the main premise of molecular simulations is to, to simulate a finite size system and make those the findings of that simulation to make predictions about how that system will behave in the thermodynamic limit. There are, there are always, however, subtle and sometimes major deviations from the thermodynamic limit. And in order to avoid these deviations, the intellectually lazy way of getting around is to simulate the largest system that you can get away with. However, that largest system is usually not very large for most calculations. And even if you can simulate really large systems, it might be inefficient. Uh, and a more uh, important philosophical question uh, or issue is what you might deem as large enough might not actually be large enough. So you really want to be able to devise metrics for determining if and when a simulation is impacted by finite size effects. And this is not a trivial task at all. And it really depends on what property or process you are interested in. So the nature of finite size effects in say estimating average density from an MPT simulation is very different from that of like a collective phenomenon such as cavitation or nucleation. Now, when it comes to nucleation, finite size effects might arise for many different reasons, uh, including uh, solute depletion in mixtures and solutions. So if you have a solution that crystallizes into a, a, a solid crystallizes outside this, uh, out of a solution, then when it joins the crystalline nucleus in a simulation, the effective concentration of that solute will change and therefore you will change the thermodynamic driving force and that could cause some artifacts. They could also arise due to ensemble artifacts, like how do you thermostat your system or whether you allow for density fluctuations in your simulations and how. And, but most notably they arise due to periodic boundary conditions that can induce unphysical interactions between a nucleus and its periodic image. So for example, if you look at this crystalline nucleus and you replicate the box along periodic dimensions, you see that there seems to be some unphysical confinement here. And that unphysical confinement or closeness can actually introduce some artifacts. And in order to, to systematically investigate this question, we took uh, structureless LJ93 walls that heterogeneously nucleated ice, and we put uh, five nanometer thick uh, films of the MW model here, and we just calculated the nucleation rate by changing the dimensions of this uh, uh, ice nucleating uh, surface. And what we observed was not surprisingly, the rate is fairly sensitive to system size. It starts really high here for small uh, surfaces, then it goes down, reaches a minimum and it starts increasing again. Uh, 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 but this curve alone doesn't tell you uh, what determines or what causes finite size effects in each point here. And in order to do that, we did a detailed structural uh, characterization of critical crystalline nuclei in all these systems. And what we observed was that in this green region, uh, we had a lot of uh, nuclei that spanned the periodic boundary. So you really didn't have an I, a finite size nucleus that was isolated. Rather, you had a lot of nuclei that were basically infinite objects that spanned along one and sometimes more uh, uh, periodic boundaries. And you see that in this green region, there is uh, an appreciable fraction of a spanning nuclei. Now we intuitively know that this shouldn't happen. And having a spanning nuclei uh, basically 
facilitates nucleation in an unphysical manner. And indeed, we see a very good cor strong correlation between the log of the nucleation rate in this spanning regime and the fraction of spanning critical nuclei. So this is easy. We knew that this shouldn't happen and we confirm it here. But lack of a spanning doesn't necessarily mean that there are no finite size effects because you can still have periodic proximity and on physical confinement. Like what we have in this yellow region here, they really look close. And in order to be able to more systematically determine what is too close, we calculated what we call an inter-image density profile for these non-spanning nuclei. So here is how it works. So you take a crystalline cluster, you look at all its closest periodic images, and you identify the, vec the shortest vector that connects one particle on this cluster to one of its periodic images. We call this an inter-image vector. And we then calculate density of the liquid along that vector as a distance of, uh, as a function of distance from the cluster. And we get curves like this. And as you can see, these curves are remarkable. The, the qualitative shape of these curves are remarkably insensitive to system size. You have three density peaks for distances less than 7.7 .7 angstrom. And beyond that, the density reaches a plateau. Now, you can sort of intuitively see that if two cr a critical nu a crystalline nucleus is closer to its closest periodic image than twice this cutoff, the water that is sitting in between and along this inter-image region will basically be layered, which is unphysical. And we call such nuclei proximal. And indeed, in this intermediate region that we are showing in shaded uh, gradient color, there is an appreciable fraction of proximal nuclei, even though there is hardly any spanning nucleus. Now, intuitively, we might think that, well, proximity in this sense should help nucleation. But you can see that nucleation rates are lower here than what we get in the infinite system. So the, the actual picture seems a little bit more complicated. And in order to see why, let's now consider non-proximal configuration. So these are uh, configurations in which the, crit the critical mm -hmm. nucleus is further from its closest periodic image than twice this cutoff. So then you can look at this image for that nucleus and you can average out this plateau density. Now, if you don't have any finite size effects whatsoever, that plateau density should match that of the liquid. So we calculated these plateau densities for the non-proximal configurations. And since we were dealing with heterogeneous nucleation, uh, we, we had to compare those densities to, sorry, this, uh, we had to compare those densities to the corresponding densities of each liquid layer. Uh, so we only looked at configurations in which the uh, inter-image vector was totally within each of these three layers. And as you can see, these plateau densities were considerably larger than the corresponding layer density in the supercooled liquid in this intermediate region. And we know that liquid water has a crystal that is less dense. So increasing density as a result of some sort of compression in this inter-image region will suppress nucleation. In other words, even though proximity might help nucleation, these non-proximal surfaces that have really high inter-image densities will basically suppress nucleation. And these factors are working against one another. Now, when you leave this proximal regime, you see that the densities uh, converge to their corresponding liquid values. And there is no, there, there is therefore no noticeable signature of finite size effects. Still the rate is a deeply sensitive to system size. There is this scaling with log of the nucleation rate and one over L, which is a cautionary tale that finite size effects might 
still exists for really large simulations. But at least here, you can be sure that that sensitivity is very weak. And you, if you repeat several calculations, maybe you can uh, uh, extrapolate your rate to the infinite thermodynamic limit. So in conclusion, so here are the conclusions. The only take home message that I want you, the main take home message to take from this work is that when you are conducting a rate calculation, you have to make sure that you don't have any uh, spanning and proximal uh, critical configurations. And you also wanna make sure that for your non-proximal configurations, these plateau inter-image properties are consistent with those of the supercooled liquid. If, you, if that's not true, uh, you will likely have finite size effects. If that is true, you might still have very weak finite size effects, but at least you, you would have done your due diligence in uh, basically exploring your calculation before reaching any conclusions. So let me go quickly through the acknowledgements. The, the, Almost all the work that I talked about today was conducted by uh, my first graduate student, Sarwar. Uh, and he's a very brilliant, uh, I was really lucky to have him as my student. And he will be in the market uh, in the next few months. He'll be graduating in summer. So if he contacts you for a postdoctoral position, he will be an excellent uh, candidate. I incidentally referred to some work from my postdoc. Uh, under the supervision of uh, Professor Pablo de Benedetti. And here are other people with whom I uh, collaborated on this work when I was a postdoc. These are the funding resources and the computational resources that we used. And at the end, I would like to thank my uh, two-year-old son who really helps me when I get stuck in a project. So this is an instance of that. So we are consulting on a project. So I would like to thank uh, again, Fred for his invitation and thank you for your patience and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Professor Haji Akpari. Uh, we are now open to questions. If you wanna ask one, uh, you can use one of the Zoom tools, uh, raise your hand. Our YouTube viewers can also ask questions by writing on the chat. Uh, I'm seeing a question here by... Uh, oh, so I, I can ask it uh, loud yes, also if yeah, that's acceptable. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So the question was uh, can you outline briefly how you extract activation barrier from FFS? And then oh. uh, does that change in any regard when you go to JFFS? Oh, these are excellent questions. So we basically use, uh, uh, there is a method developed by uh, uh, Fernando Escobedo, uh, uh, which basically calculates uh, two things from an FFS, uh, from FFS trajectories, a steady state distribution and a mean first passage time distribution. And then by combining these two, at least for, uh, reaction coordinates or order parameters that have a diffusive behavior, uh, you, can ex you can construct the free energy profiles. So we did a we use a slightly modified version of that method. We are still working on generalizing it to a JFFS because in JFFS, jumpiness uh, throws a wrench into yeah. that whole picture. And we're trying to address that. So in that regard, the free energy profiles that I showed you, you should take them with a grain of salt. They're sort of accurate, but they're not completely accurate. And we are trying to uh, basically figure out the details. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question, uh, who wants to go? There is a one question in the chat. Uh, maybe someone can I'm ask just... uh, directly. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, do do you want to read the question, or do you want me to read it? No, sir. 
Someone is here, so he no, can no, ask. I can. Uh, uh, it's nice. I can ask it directly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. I don't know if, if you can hear me. Yes, yeah, I do. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it was an excellent talk. I, I just had a general question regarding uh, studies of nucleation, and I just want wondering if uh, your simulations use uh, MD thermostats or you do them yes. under NVE conditions. We use MV, we use thermostats and we use a nozzle Hoover thermostat. Uh, so uh, this could potentially be problematic because there is a heat release during uh, crystallization. But there are some papers uh, that I don't remember uh, exactly who by who, but we have cited them in our finite size effect paper uh, that show that thermostatting doesn't really introduce that much error. Uh, into the rates and the mechanisms that you extract from MD simulations. Okay, and that's independent of the dimensions of the layer, for example, um, as the, some of the layers get smaller, um, one would think perhaps that the, the thermostatting would become a little bit, or the heat transfer effects would become more severe. Um, that's an excellent question. I think that particular paper, they had looked at homogeneous nucleation, but uh, yes, you yeah. are raising a very important question, and uh, we haven't really, uh, we haven't tried to address them in detail and systematically. But those are those are very important questions. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't. The, the short answer is I don't know the answer, oh, wow. but I think I think generally speaking, uh, when you're thinking about nucleation. The rate of nucleation is so sensitive to many, many different things like the force field and stuff that we're really interested in getting some basic understanding of the underlying physics. In other words, the actual number that we get is not as important as uh, the physical insight that we gain into the process. And, and, and the other uh, issue, of course, with any uh, uh, with with the real nucleation is suddenly the uh, temperature, for example, of the ice shoots up to zero degrees as it freezes, and so you get these yes. um, very very strong um, thermal gradients establishing yes. that a company. Uh, and one way, perhaps, of partially at least seeing that is doing NVE simulations. Yes, because at least um, you you can establish some uh, long term uh, heat. Uh, temperature gradients. And so maybe at least partially that could account for some of those effects. But in, in the, indeed, there's no easy way of simulating um, the real system with regard to temperature, temperature effects. That's correct. Yeah, I totally agree. And uh, I think some people have tried to uh, develop ways of uh, going around this thermostatting problem. But, uh, but we haven't we haven't used any of these methods because they're a little bit difficult to use with advanced sampling techniques. I mean, you need certain uh, statistical properties of the method to be able to use them with something like FFS. So mm -hmm. we, we really didn't think that these effects are important in terms of the questions that we wanna address. Definitely they impact nucleation uh, as a real phenomenon, but, uh, but yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the excellent questions. Um, do we have another question? Uh, can I ask a comment on the question? Of course, go ahead. Uh, Professor Akbari, thank you for a very fascinating talk. I can, can you comment on, is there any connection with the growth rate and the nucleation rate? or you assume that are these nucleus particles don't grow? Oh, that's an excellent question. So the method, uh, so the regime that we are looking at uh, is a regime in which growth rates are much larger than nucleation rates. So we don't really, we, we assume that they are in, in a sense uncoupled from one another, uh, but uh, that is generally speaking, I think, broken when the nucleation rate is too large. So if you look, for example, uh, at the mean first passage uh, time profile, you basically have like a sigmoidal increase and then there is a weaker linear increase. So 
that would that would create that would in, introduce small errors into the uh, rates that I just reported here, but we don't think that those errors are really that significant. At least they don't change the order of magnitude of the rate, which is what we usually care about. But that's an excellent question. Uh, there is another comment or question I would like to ask. Is mm -hmm. uh, you are talking about ice nucleation for cases like uh, sublimation from, say, ammonium chloride vapor into ammonium chloride crystals, with such uh, simulation will it work? Because water seems to be a very different thing from, say, ammonium chloride, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so studying uh, sublimation, I think is, uh, that's, a more, that's a more difficult problem in the sense that you need large simulation boxes. And uh, I mean, people have studied sublimation uh, like the systems such as the Leonard Jones, but uh, those are, I would say those would be more difficult simulations than, uh, uh, than just studying like liquid solid transition. And the last uh, ordering, is there something like a weak hydrogen bonding in water molecules and will it influence or you don't worry about it? Uh, what do you mean by weak hydrogen bonding? Maybe I didn't fully understand your question. <laughs> uh, you keep reading in literature, there is a hydrogen bonding different from the usual hydrogen bonding thing, they call a weak hydrogen bonding in, at least in bioprocessors, they keep talking about it. That mm -hmm. means there are weak interaction, orientation interaction, other interactions between water molecules. The other is when the clusters form, there is a repulsive interaction between the clusters. Okay, I see. Yeah, so uh, the existence of those uh, effects will definitely impact what I predicted here quantitatively, uh, but I don't think it's it's gonna they're gonna change the. Uh, qualitative picture. For example, thinking about contact freezing, the core question is, okay, uh, how do the two interfaces talk to one another when they get really close? And I think like the existence of weak hydrogen bonding is unlikely to impact that. And I don't even know, I don't, I don't think that those are included in uh, the parameterization of the force fields that we are using. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. Very fascinating talk. Thank you. Thank you for the nice questions. Hey, can I? I would like to yes, go write ahead. A, que a question. Okay. So, very nice talk, Amir. So, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, and I have a few questions concerning the question raised before about the role of the thermostat. I think Pablo Montero, who is about to finish the PhD with us. Uh, we published a paper uh, two years ago uh, showing that the growth rate of ice is quite similar in MPT ensemble and MBE ensemble. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems at least for growth rate, the thermostat is not playing a big role. And this is so because typically the growth rate is of a few one angstrom per five nanosecond or something like that. So it grows very slowly. However, heated chain is much faster. You just need to collide. Molecules can collide and heated chain is down via a collision and is faster than the time required to grow ice. So concerning the growth uh, rate, I can say we have shown that for ice is not affected. I mean, and we have shown that it has a maximum of about minus 15 Kelvin below the melting point and concerning that. So I think we can be confident, at least with growth rate. And I, my suspicion is for, if this is so for growth rate, I don't think for, for nucleation, it may have a big impact. However, finely size effect, I totally agree. And I think uh, the result of Amir has been quite interesting at the end because uh, we have not studied in detail in the past uh, finely size effect uh, 
in nucleation rate. I should say that even the coexistent values are affected by finite size effect. Even for higher spheres, mm -hmm. the, the pressure of the transition between the fluid and the solid is 11.57 for a very, very large system. But if you go to system of about 1,000 uh, molecules, uh, the coexistent pressure from thermodynamics decreases. So point number one, the melting point is also affected by fine size effect, the coexistent point. point, yes. Uh, even for hard spheres. And, and, and point, even taking that into account, I should say that in general, when the system becomes smaller, nucleation rate are higher. I mean, there is a very simple argument. The, the nuclear, uh, the critical cluster cannot be larger than the simulation box. So when okay. you are very close to the coexistent point in the thermodynamic limit, uh, classical nucleation theory is telling you that the critical size of the, of the nucleus should be infinity. But if your system has 1,000 molecules, it cannot be infinity. It cannot be larger yes. than 1,000. And, yes. and, 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 and I should mention that the, the, one of the most cited papers on the nucleation eyes uh, is uh, one published in Nature in 2002. Yeah. Which, uh, <laughs> it has 800,000, no, 800 citations, sorry, 800 citations. And they were able to uh, show the formation of ice at a temperature of about minus three Kelvin below the melting point for a system having 250 molecules. If you try to do that with a system of several thousand molecules, you don't get, uh, you don't get ice. Since this was the first time that ice was formed spontaneously in a simulation, you got a nature paper. Even though this paper, in my modest opinion, the nucleation was due to finding size effect. Uh, it's very- Of course, yes. I, I never was able to nucleate ice uh, T4P spontaneously. I mean, that's uh, with MW, you can use that. So I think your study, uh, Amir, is very interesting. And I, I think you, you have uh, a very interesting point about the impact on nucleation and, and finding size effect. However, I should say that you are putting the emphasis on the density and you are showing the density and whether you have a plateau or not. And I would say that the density is a local property. However, the chemical potential, for instance, is a non-local property. So having, having a plateau in the density because the chemical potential may be affected by the behavior of the system at three or four molecular diameters, uh, even having a plateau in the density may not be enough to have a bulk region. Would you agree with this? Of course, of course. And yeah, and you can see that uh, the rate is the rate is still changing. Uh, if I can go back, uh, the rate is still changing even after we have density plateau, right? So that's an excellent point. I think uh, that chemical potential differences. Uh, impacted by finite size effects. And I actually didn't talk about this. And, but you can show that you would, you would expect some sort of power law scaling for the, the log of the nucleation rate with uh, the system size uh, if you use classical nucleation theory. And that's precisely because of this power law dependence of say chemical potential difference or surface tension on uh, uh, on uh, uh, the, the system size. Uh, one point that I would like to mention, and this is not about nucleation. This is a work that we are doing on other systems uh, or other processes. Uh, when you have electrostatics, things become much worse, I think. I mean, you might have uh, like, strong finite size effects, even when you have tens of thousands of molecules. And uh, I think when it comes to nucleation, this is a question that is extremely difficult to study because even getting one rate can take you months, if not years. Uh, but that is an issue to be cognizant of that. Let's say if your uh, critical nucleus has a dipole, uh, a net dipole, and then it starts interacting with its uh, uh, periodic images, or if it starts ordering the water molecule in, in intermediate image region, then you could have finite size effects well beyond what the measures that I just 
suggested here would suggest. So, but I I I take your point that having electrostatics may things even more complex. But I will argue that the critical nucleus should have not a net dipole moment because in principle hexagonal eyes has zero dipole moment because you have this order of protons and so and you will expect mm -hmm. that the critical nucleus has not net dipole moment. I would say. Yeah, that's true in a real system. So my point is when you're simulating, uh, say using something like FFS or umbrella sampling, uh, it usually forms a stacking disordered ice. And uh, it's also, uh, it might take a little bit for it to uh, basically relax these dipoles, right? So we're talking about a non-equilibrium dynamic process at the, the moment that you form those nuclei, uh, they might not be zero okay. dipole, right? Even if that dipole dissipates to zero later on. And and what do you think? I think your your paper on 2018 about showing that uh, forward flow sampling is not done carefully could lead to underestimate uh, of the nucleation rate. Uh, because, yes, uh, yes. So I think this is a very important message that you saw three years ago that uh, yes, and in yes, general yes. i think is it true amir that in general you tend to underestimate nucleation rate well not necessarily oh with okay so if you do conventional ffs the way that i described it properly in the sense that you equilibrate your basin for sufficiently long times uh, and you'd repeat the same calculation with jffs I think generally speaking, conventional FFS will underestimate rate, but there are ways of overestimating the rate with FFS. So for example, imagine you don't sample your basin properly and for long enough, and you're lucky to get really good crossing events that are really good at growing. So statistically, you won't get the right rate. You will get a much higher rate, which if you average out for a longer simulation of the basin, let's say for hundred times longer will go down. Uh, so it is possible to get higher rates, but if you do it properly, yes, generally speaking, it will underestimate the rate. And my final question is, uh, I am confused about surface, the role of surface freezing of ice. I don't have an opinion at this point whether uh, the surface is helping or not the nucleation of ice. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your opinion? And in case it depends on the model of water use, NW, T4PIs, uh, do you think that the lack of orientational degree of freedom in NW could affect the physics of the problem? Uh, what is your opinion about surface freezing? Does a free first surface help nucleation of ice or not? What is your, your current point of view? So there seems to be a lot of experimental evidence supporting it. And there's a, there was a paper actually a couple of weeks ago in JAX, uh, which uh, this is an experimental paper with, in which uh, they claim to uh, provide more conclusive evidence for surface dominated nucleation and smaller droplets. I haven't read the paper carefully yet, and I look forward to doing that and I would, uh, basically defer to my experimental colleagues to assess its uh, accuracy. Uh, but when it comes to computational methods, I don't really know, right? Uh, so we looked at, we compared your tip 4 pi model and MW, and there seems to be that one of the differences is that uh, in the tip 4 pi model, uh, there is a tendency for favoring the formation of cubic ice at the subsurface region uh, of a free interface, so right, not right next to the free interface, but a little bit lower. And that sort of makes uh, surface uh, nucleation faster, but we didn't see that tendency then MW, and that could well arise from what you described, that there aren't enough orientational degrees of freedom and maybe some uh, charge effects at the surface that exists in like atomistic models. Okay, thank you very much, Amir.
Thanks a lot for the excellent questions, uh, Carlo. Uh, George and Lange uh, wrote a question on the chat. I'm going to read it. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Professor Ami. My question is, in general, by his experience, which force field in molecular dynamics is better to reproduce properties in homogeneous and heterogeneous nucleation? For example, freezing contact and surface. Not all force fields take into account the tetraedrally of water molecules. And force fields do not work well at low temperature to give accurate results in heat capacity. Free energy due to non-consideration of quantum mechanical effects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think I would actually defer uh, to Karlov regarding this question because he has, uh, uh, he has explored and studied this force field way, way more than I have done. And uh, so I don't know the answer. And generally we don't really have good nucleation data uh, for most force fields. I think generally speaking, tip for P type force fields as Carlos has shown in numerous papers do reasonably well in predicting homogeneous nucleation at least. For heterogeneous nucleation, there aren't really that many uh, studies using atomistic models as far as I know. I, uh, I would say that the D4PIs for homogeneous nucleation is uh, reasonable for uh, predicting yes. experimental properties. It's not uh, in full agreement with experiment. In fact, I should mention that even for 230, we don't have yet uh, uh, an estimate of the nucleation rate of T4PIs because uh, Amir published uh, with Pablo a certain value. Then with the jumping method, you probably suggest that it should be increased by four or five order of magnitude. Oh, yes. And then Parinello published another estimate and ourselves, but I would say if we take the average of all the values on the table, <laughs> And fortunately, there will be in the future some consensus. It's not too far from experiment. Not too yes. far means three or four order of magnitude of deviation with experiment. Concerning heterogeneous, I think you need a good force field for the interaction between the surface and the T4PI. So, I mean, it's not only the problem of, of, of the water model, but uh, the cross interaction between the surface and, 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 and the water model. So you can have terrible results or, or very good. And I would say not much work has been done on the heterogeneous. And concerning the heat capacity, uh, I will refer to the talk. <laughs> I was, uh, heat capacity is not given, I, I totally agree. Heat capacity is not well described by classical mechanics. Even if you do Athenitio Carparinello, but you still do classical mechanics, you will not describe the heat capacity of, of water because you need to include nuclear quantum effect. However, in my point of view, I don't think uh, this is uh, probably crucial to understand nucleation, but this is just a point of view. I don't have the complete answer. And just to echo the, 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 what uh, the Carlos said, one major problem with studying heterogeneous nucleation is basically polarizability and screening effects. And uh, the fact that uh, the charge distribution uh, next to a surface is usually very different than what would arise due to classical models. Now, when you have an atomistic model, uh, you obviously have the rotatability, which can uh, partly uh, respond to the existence of the surface, but even that is not perfect. So I think we really need a combination of polarizability and uh, quantum effects to model, I don't know, ionization or charge transfer to be able to accurately calculate uh, the estimate population rates and simulations. But those types of simulations are uh, generally speaking a few times more expensive than non-polarizable models. And even uh, for studying nucleation with non-polarizable models, they are still expensive. They're not like cheap calculations. Mm 
But let us say that it's a tool of force that just having the homogeneous nucleation rate at 230 for water for a simple model like T4PIs, which is non porosible we are still working on that. We, I mean, that was not possible 10 years ago and we are yes. just in the beginning. So we don't have yet values of heterogeneous nucleation in comparison with experiments. So we are just uh, understanding homogeneous and, and, and we should work more on this problem to see the limitation. And probably what you mentioned, Amir, is true. At the end, polarization can be improve the results, but we don't have even the results for a non polarizable model. So uh, yes. we are just getting now uh, uh, an estimate of the nucleation rate of ice, of, of formation of ice at 230 Kelvin using T4PIs. And, and different groups differing about seven order of magnitude. Uh, still, we should work more to, to get a good number not too far from experiment. And after we get numbers for the homogeneous, it's time to go to the heterogeneous. And this is a challenge from computation. I mean, uh, even I should say, even for hard spheres, the community is discussing the discrepancy in the nucleation rate of hard spheres between experiments and simulation. So yes. there is a debate on the nucleation yes. rate, even for hard spheres, in the homogeneous nucleation of hard spheres. So, so that to mean that, uh, but in experiments, I think in water is better. Even though experiments, experimental measure has some discrepancies, but in general, the picture is better in, in ice formation than in hard spheres. Now, one thing that I would like to add is uh, we continued bashing and ponding simulations, and there are a lot of limitations in simulation studies, but Heterogeneous nucleation rate measurements in experiments, they're really messy. Like you can have impurities and then it's not really easy to characterize the surface because it has been, for example, shown using coarse grain models that you have, you have steps, if you have cavities uh, or uh, towers, all of these things can impact uh, the kinetics of nucleation. And, when you're, you're doing experiments, you're just taking an average, right? Which you don't have the luxury of in simulations. Uh, so uh, the, the, the problem is difficult from both sides, both in terms of experimentally characterizing what surface you're nucleating on, and also on the simulation side to have a good description for uh, water surface interactions and polarizability and charge transfer effects. Okay, uh, do we have any more questions? I have a very simple question. I mean, thank you for the presentation, very nice. Uh, I wonder uh, in a uh, heterogeneous nucleation, uh, you get the final structure at the beginning, or you see the structure change uh, on the, over the time and depend on the uh, size of the film. Uh, I don't know if it's clear by question, but... Uh. Okay, so the way that we do that is we don't make any assumptions about how the structure looks like. Uh, we just have an order parameter that it basically distinguishes a molecule that has solid-like environment and the molecule that has liquid-like environment. And then we cluster the solid-like environments that are neighboring into like these nuclei. And the only thing that we know is that uh, they are a combination of like uh, hexagonal and cubic ice. So they could be like a stacking disordered sort of nuclei. But we don't make any assumptions about the shape and the size of these nuclei. They, they naturally emerge from the calculation that we do. But uh, they start as, uh, in one structure and change uh, uh, over time, or, or they, uh, they start in the final uh, structure, right? No, 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 no. We start with the liquid and we no, gradually... I, I don't. You start, but the first crystal or the first uh, structure uh, close to the wall uh, change the oh. structure or not during the... 
Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so sorry. Then sorry that I misunderstood your question. No, so, I, I, I was my fault. <laughs> so, so, so this is an excellent question. So the structural changes that I described, those happen in the liquid. This is even before crystallization happens. So the change in RDF, the change in, in Q3 profile and everything, those are within the supercore liquid. And we are arguing that those structural changes basically sort of facilitate nucleation. Uh, in other words, they make the liquid more likely to crystallize at the free interface. And the actual nucleation process, and I didn't, uh, I wasn't, I didn't have time to go through that, but they could start at either interface. They mostly start at the wall, but sometimes the, crystal, the crystalline nucleus starts forming at the free interface because of this modulation. Then it joins the other nuclei that are in the wall, and then you have this hourglass shaped nucleus. Uh, did I? Did I answer your question? Yes, I yes. Make, yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the other point is uh, about the size effect. Uh, uh, instead of uh, following the dense local density, uh, I don't know if it uh, help uh, following the orientation of water close to the crystal. Uh, maybe it's more sensitive than uh, the, the local density. I don't know. Yeah, that's, that's an excellent point. So the, the, the force field that we are using here is MW. So we don't have any rotational degrees of freedom here. But I think in, uh, if you're studying crystallization of material that uh, a molecule or a particle that has rotational degrees of freedom, definitely those rotational uh, features might be more predictive of whether you have finite size effects or not. Uh, but they, we don't have those degrees of freedom here. I mean, uh, with this, uh, I mean, if it wasn't for the coarse grain nature, these calculations would take ten years to finish. <laughs> like with only with only coarse grain models, we can do them so quickly. So, uh, but if, you are if, raising an important point. If you crystallize, uh, like of when I join uh, instead of uh, real water. Uh, Maybe, uh, therefore, uh, we are not going to have any kind of uh, uh, polarization of this uh, nuclei. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but it will still have a uh, size effect. Yes, yes. So, and uh, we're, looking, we're looking at that question right now, actually. We're uh, looking at homogeneous nucleation in the Leonard Jones system. And there are still finite size effects, but uh, they're generally speaking dominated by basically spanning clusters. So as long as you, you don't have any spanning and proximal clusters, everything is basically insensitive to the system size, at least in the state points that we have looked at. Thank you. Anyone has another question? I think it's time, yeah. yeah. Uh, I have, our time is almost over, so I think it's time to wrap it up. I would like to thank you so much, Professor Hajiak Bari, for the presentation. Mm -hmm.